Kia ora and welcome to another Aotearoa Rugby pod. Plenty of good rugby to talk this week, including two massive clashes. The top four teams up against each other. We're going to see what the table is going to start looking like towards the end of the season. As we've seen the Chiefs play the Crusaders and the Hurricanes play the Brumbies. So plenty to get into there. Plus, we've got a special guest in once again this week to chat a bit of boxing, if you'd believe, plus a little bit of rugby along the way. James Parsons with us, of course, as ever. But Sam Tui Tupo, former All Black, former Blues player, and now boxer <laughs> in their fight for life. This Thursday, a charitable boxing fight for our viewers around the world. Sam, how did you end up in this fighting to help people at I Am Hope for Mental Health? Uh, to be honest, uh, you know, obviously I'm part of the WhatsApp group of the Blues and that, and it sort of popped up and that, and, um, you know, Ali sort of messaged the boys and said, oh, listen, there's an opportunity for someone to fight uh, one of the lead boys. Um, so I sort of seen it and I left it for about, you know, four or five days and no one had sort of responded to the message. So, uh, and then obviously Brad Lamika said, oh, what about Sammy? Sammy be keen. <laughs> so anyway, I, I just, I sort of just messaged back. She said, no, no, I'm keen. If, um, you know, I'm, I'm keen if, if, they, if they want me to come down. So uh, anyway, I messaged um, Ali and I said, well, if, if they're keen, um, to pay me from the UK, then I'll definitely put me down, put me down. So, you know, you don't get the flight allowance like you normally do during the rugby and all that. So now that you're retired, she's got to make the most of any opportunity to get home. So, so yeah. The boys are like, I'll fight. The boys are like, no, nah. <laughs> you're an A. <laughs> oh, no, exactly. And, you know, and obviously it's for a good cause. And, uh, you know, I always love watching it every year. And uh, I just thought this time was like, you know, another amount of rugby in there. I've got nothing else to sort of worry about. Um, you know, why not? So, so yeah. Yeah, you're up against Roy Asatasi, mm -hmm. uh, former rugby league player, big prop, one of the greats probably to yeah. play the game. Mm -hmm. Probably a good 20 kg heavier than you though. Oh, he's, you know, Roy's, he's slimmed down, uh, slimmed down these days. Um, he's looking fit as well. So, uh, you know, they say that uh, the league forwards are, uh, you know, stronger boys in, in the rugby, so uh, you know, it's a good way to test, test to make sure. Find out. Yeah, yeah, exactly. To I find noticed out. none of the rugby forwards uh, took the fight on, so yeah, <laughs> well, this is a little bit. But yeah. how's the training been? Is, is it um, different to what you've been? Oh using? yeah, no, definitely. And um, you know, it was, it was actually quite lucky because um, it sort of came Christmas time, and I thought, you know what, when it comes to New Year's, I'll sort of. I'll start a good routine, you know, and sort of get back in the training. Um, because obviously it has been quite difficult, you know, where you've come from, a, you know, from years of having a schedule, you know, training hard, and you've got something to look forward to playing on a weekend and that. But now I'm, now it's sort of like training, but there's nothing to train for. So when this opportunity came up, I thought, you know, and it's really helped me sort of get back in the training as well. Yeah. I'm really enjoying it. But the thing about boxing is that, you know, everyone just thinks that you just throw punches and, you know, and it works. But actually, there's more to it. It's an art, you know, of obviously all of the movements, your hip movements, you know, get all your power from your hips and all that, your legs. So, you know, just learning that over the last couple of seven, eight weeks and that has been really enjoyable. And, you know, um, we'll just see how it goes. If I go well this, this Thursday, then, you know, maybe there might be something for next next year as well. Uh, what's the game plan here? You, you, you're to the body, you're going to the head. You know, obviously, there's been a lot of talk, but, you know, I'm just going to go full on. Um, obviously, Roy's a lot fitter. So, uh, you know, for me, I've just got to knock him out early, <laughs> to be honest. Are you guys in headgear that's or no simple. headgear? Um, well, I'll be wearing my rugby headgear. I don't know if you're allowed to, <laughs> but, uh, you know, that's, that's a trademark of mine, so why not, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough, eh? You put that into some dark places along the way. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. And, you know, like, you know, for rugby, you know, once I've put that headgear on, that means I'm down, you know, it means there business. And, and uh, every time I've had it on, I've always felt that, you know, nothing can stop me. So, uh, so once I put that on on Thursday, Roy, you better watch out. Well, if it's anything like the tackling, I'm sure you're going to go very well. <laughs> you ran the other way from that WhatsApp group, didn't you? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. I bet Roy would make uh, light work of me, I can assure you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. he could run the ball up. Yeah. That was, that well, was what, what, to be honest, the first, when the, when, the, when the group came out, when the thing came out, it was uh, Russell Packer. Obviously, right. he's an even bigger boy. Yeah. And so when I took it on, I thought, you know what, he's a big boy, I sort of run him around and all that. Then when they sent through the contract, I looked at it and it had Roy's name on it. I said, is this the right contract? Because it's got Roy's name on it. I said, no, no, you're fighting Roy now. Cause, uh, so then obviously, game plan's gone out the window because yeah. well, obviously I knew he was in the crossfit. And I was like, oh, no, no, I'm going to <laughs> I'm gonna have to run uh, twice as long now. Yeah. So, but yeah, I mean, that's, you know. I'm How many rounds is it? So only three rounds. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, two minutes. But it feels quite long. In the yeah, yeah, so I yeah. remember any sort of preseason when we did boxing, man, yeah. two minutes felt a long time. Yeah. Especially with my boxing technique. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you see it every single time when you watch, you know, you got guys who are really fit, 
but then they go full on for the 30, sec uh, 30 seconds and then rest, they're literally buggered for the rest of the um, round and that's so I'm like, oh, you know, do I sort of hold back a yeah. bit or do I just go hard out? So yeah. I don't know, we'll, we'll see Thursday night when Bring it comes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You get a charge out of the corner like Mike Tyson. <laughs> yeah. Like, just, just yeah. run at the bloke. <laughs> just get in the first <laughs> shot. Well, I've always said, you know, you, you're better off getting getting one in before they get one in. So, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> one of the things I was thinking when I saw that matchup was like, you know, you're not the biggest bloke, especially for a, a modern professional midfield back. Like yeah. some of these blokes, like you think about the 12s that have come through yeah. the All Blacks, like Ma Nonu and Sonny Bill Williams. These guys are monsters, and you're, you're a little bit smaller, mm -hmm. but you created a legacy of packing a punch. Oof. You know, yeah. like he got very excited when we mentioned <laughs> that you could come on, you know, because. Yeah. You had that legacy. We we were talking about Rupini Thautau and Butha last week, about how he only played 14 games for the Blues, but his legacy is yeah. off the charts. Yeah. And it, the same, I mean, you played a few more, 38, but you're a very memorable cat for the way that you approached your tackling and the way you ran up. Like, mm -hmm. how did you, this is the longest question in the world, <laughs> how did you end up with that as your strong point? How did that yeah, happen? Yeah. Well, I guess it's, it's obviously, it, it helps a lot when you've got four other brothers, you know, and yeah. and when you're playing on the front front lawn, uh, you know, of the house and that, and they're always running over the top of you. You're like, you know, uh, but these are my brothers who are a few years older than me. So then, when you're sort of playing against guys your age, you know, it becomes a bit easier. But I've always found that I've always been the smallest out of you know all my mates and that, and obviously playing against other teams, and that you know, I've always felt that you know being the smallest, I've actually you know everyone sort of targets you. So. Mm -hmm. You know, I really enjoyed tackling from a young age, growing up with the brothers and that, and you know, them being a lot older and bullying me all the time. I think I, I sort of learned quite early on that, uh, mm. you know, I had to sort of either get, you know, learn to mix with the big boys, or or I'm going to be the one that's been running over, being run over all the time. So, so yeah. What was so special? I suppose looking at the Blues in particular, it's my common angle on the show. <laughs> um, <laughs> but 2003, um, did, was there something different about it, or you just got on a hot run? I think we just gone on a hot run, to be honest. I mean, if you look at, I mean, back then, you you know, we knew that the boys were talented, but looking at now, you know, reflecting back on the time, you know, you can't, I can't actually believe I was actually part of that team, and especially if that was my first year of Super Rugby as well. Mm. You know, we had good players in front of us, in front of me, but for some reason, I just had a good pre-season um, and then sort of just kicked on, you know. Um, played the first warm game um, and then just I was lucky enough just to get the start and then just didn't look back from there. You know, we had guys like Jason Schumacher who was in, you know, he was yeah. the year above me, but he was a good player as well. You know, he was the captain for the Tony Fars um, and he was part of the Super Rugby the year before me. So, you know, I had other guys, you know, in front of me that I thought that, you know, I would never get a chance, but I was lucky enough when I did get it. I just made the most of it. Yeah, a few old heads too. At least Edson's was still floating yep. around there, wasn't mm -hmm. it? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Um, and so. you had Carlos inside you. Yeah. You had a few people to lean and on. And I think, you know, having those guys in around me as well, I think that sort of gave me the confidence to be able to do what I enjoy doing. But at the same time, I think I had to earn that respect from the boys as well. Um, and I had the likes of Ronnie Clark around, who was able to, you know, who really took us in, especially the young guys, mm. took us in and really made us feel like, you know, uh, part of the team. Because um, obviously back then, you know, being the younger boys and that, you always got the, uh, you always had to wash all the, all the uh, boots in there and the team and always cast it, uh, cast it out to the side. But, uh, you know, he really took us on and, and really helped us as well. And I think, you know, if it wasn't for him, uh, you know, I don't think I would have had the opportunity, but... Do you see what he did and think that's what I need to do too? Yeah, and I think the culture now, the Blues and that, like the younger guys coming through, it mm. just shows that, you know, when you look after them and you mm. sort of give them that, that sort of... Um, that care and, and love that they need, you know, they just come through and they blossom as well. So, mm. and that's one of the things you're doing now as a player agent. That you was that something you wanted to step into when you finished your career? You thought um, this is a, this is a hole that I need to fill? Yeah, no, nah, no. Nah. <laughs> you know, coaching was always the um, transition for me. So with the the Sharks and that that I was playing for at, at the time, um, you know, my transition was I was always going to come back and so they sort of let me go for a couple of years. We had an agreement where I'll go to Coventry as a player coach and then I'll come back to, to the Sharks and that. Um, but then after a couple of years and obviously doing a lot of work with the PRPW, the Pacific Player uh, Rugby Welfare and that, um, agency was always, uh, agents was always a topic that always came up for a lot of the boys. And um, I guess it was just a leap of faith to be honest, because you know, as, as a coach and that, you want to sort of help boys develop and see them develop and, and kick on and that. And I just thought, you know, 
maybe being an agent is exactly the same, but helping more the players off the field, mm -hmm. you know, because once you look after, you know, once boys have got things looked after off the field and that, it just makes their job a lot easier on the field and then it just helps them to be able to, um, to progress, and especially being on, on their side of the world, mm. where I think a lot of the help is needed off the field for not the players, but more the, the families, like the wife and the kids, because I think it's more the wives and the kids in that. If they're not settled, then the players in that feel the, you know, they feel the sort of pressure in that, and then, mm. you know, they're either gonna not, not perform well or they'll just end up just packing up and coming back. I think agents are massive. Um, you know, I think of myself and my journey, um, they almost become part of your family, or at least your immediate yeah. family. Mm -hmm. um, and they are a massive trusted resource for, yeah. I think, your parents and, and your wife, yeah. um, kids mm -hmm. particularly. Like, um, I think every player, if, the, if they've got a good relationship and the agents align to their goals, it sets them up to actually achieve what they want to achieve. But more importantly, if they've got their stuff sorted off field, Normally yeah. it transforms into the field of playing, yeah, playing yeah. really well because mm. um, they're decluttered. So um, I, I always say to young players coming through, it's one of the most important relationships to get right um, and making sure that you make them aware of what you want to achieve yeah. so that they're working on the basis mm. of, of getting you to the place you want to go. In 2007, was it, that you arrived yep. over there at Worcester? Yep. Was that one of the things you noticed immediately, was that you needed somebody to help you settle in? Yeah, and, and I guess, you know, obviously... The agents here, like in New Zealand, you know, I had one of the best as well. And um, my time here in New Zealand, it was awesome. But then as soon as I went overseas, you know, it was almost like they, you hand over the responsibility to the agents that they have over there. Mm. And, uh, and I didn't feel comfortable. Well, you know, he was there to, uh, to welcome me in, you know, get everything signed, but then you wouldn't see him until the next time the contract's ready to negotiate. So, and I felt I didn't have that support as well. Um, you know, especially being overseas. Um, a few times I sort of had a couple of um, tax bills that sort of turned up unexpectedly, you know, and, and that sort of took, you know, a big chunk out of uh, my finances as well. Um, mm. But also, you know, um, just little things with the family as well, you know. Um, obviously, that was the main reason why I left uh, New Zealand was um, for personal uh, reasons. Uh, and that sort of broke down before I went over, so obviously, yeah, it was tough going over at the beginning. Um, and mum ended up coming over to help me look after the kids. And then after about a year and a half, mum ended up coming back with the kids. So then I was ended up there by myself, um, finishing off uh, you know, another two years on my contract. And, um, and then sort of that finished up and then I was on my way back home, um, getting ready to sort of negotiate, come back to the Blues. And then I sort of had an offer come through for mm -hmm. Munster. Um, I rang mum and mum was like, you know, since you're on that side of the world, you know, just sort of, you know, might as well say, take the one year and then see what happens after that. So I went over and got engaged to uh, <laughs> my partner, who my wife now, and then ended up back in the UK again. So then, and obviously that's where I've ended up now. So, um, but in saying that, you know, if I had the right sort of advice from the agents and that I have over there, then, you know, things could have been a lot different. Um, things could have been a lot smoother. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, Obviously, one of the main reasons why I've decided to become an agent was to sort of help that transition and give the boys the right uh, advice as well. Yeah, that family backing, like your mum heading over, mm -hmm. if, the, if the people don't have that when they get there, you know, you're so used to having, especially in Polynesian families, yeah. such a wide mm -hmm. base, yep. right? No. Well, and, and you find that with a lot of the boys now, um, you know, especially the younger guys who end up going over there thinking they're going to come back, mm -hmm. and then they obviously, you know, in my situation where they find, have a, you know, they get a partner or wife and they have kids and they end up staying there. They don't have that support what they're used to back home. So, you know, they're ending up relying on a lot of the other boys, you know. So most of the times during Christmas and that, you know, I normally, we have uh, invite a lot of the rugby league families and that on Christmas Day, but we normally have it at the Sail Shouts Rugby Club, you know, and we have about 100 people that normally turn up, turn up and then we sort of cook a, cook a pig on the spit and that and the families turn up and, you know, it's a really good day. It just makes us feel like we're back at home, you know, where some guys don't have that sort of luxury of having their sport around them and they're just at home by themselves or their family having, having Christmas where they're not used to it, so, yeah. so yeah. Yeah, it's a completely different world, isn't it? It certainly is. Um, and I, I think it's so crucial um, to have that sort of support network. And you do see a lot of, uh, I suppose, players that go up there, they, they do connect yeah. together, the, mm -hmm. especially the Keys, even from other teams. Yeah. Especially in France, a lot of the players um, have a great bond. Yeah. Um, and and uh, it's, it's critical to their, 
I suppose, success on the field, but also yep. making sure their families are happy off it. Mm. Um, so now as an agent, is the, with, with your clients, is that that's essentially the approach you have. It's kind of an entire life yeah. process, not mm -hmm. a business agreement. No, no, exactly. And, um, you know, for me, it's like I never really got into for, for the money. Uh, even though the wife keeps saying to me, like, well, how are we going to survive? <laughs> uh, but, you know, you can see, I can see her, where she's coming from, but at the same time, it's like, this is my way of giving back to, to the players, mm. um, especially the young kids as well, especially in New Zealand. Guys who are sort of good enough to play Mitre 10 or Super Rugby, but haven't been able to break through, mm. you know, and they sort of fall behind, and they end up working back at the factories and that. You know, there's guys like that that you want to sort of help out and give them a second chance and that to sort of, you know, get back into the game that they really enjoy because a lot of boys put life on hold in that, and then when it doesn't help out, it doesn't work out, then obviously they fall away. Um, but there are opportunities, you know, and I try and say to kids that, you know, if you want to play international, uh, like, first of all, it's like, why do you want to play rugby? Is it the lifestyle? Is it finance? Is it you want to travel the world? Is it you want to get a degree out of it? Because there's plenty of places where you can go and play rugby, mm -hmm. still get a degree, you know, still would do um, through the clubs and that. You can get scholarships and that to do, you know, studies online and all that. And so, you know, some, you know, that's the things that, that we can help players get, you know, and enjoy playing the game that they really love. Mm, mm. So, How do you connect with the players in the first place? I've always wondered that. How does a player end up with an agent? What's the process? It's normally player to player. We'll yeah. Put you in touch. Yeah. Mm. That's what I find a lot of the time is if someone asks your opinion, you'll say, oh, well, I reckon this guy's really yeah. good. And you, you, the players that's already with them normally set up a meeting. Mm. All right. So you yeah. go to a trusted source and Pretty much. you end up with mm -hmm. the right people. Yep. Yeah. 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 Oh. And players trust players the most, you know, because yeah. they, they, they're in their world. Yeah. Um, so it's that word of mouth that's the strongest, yeah. I mm -hmm. believe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So with you, I suppose, did you go straight to repping some of the people you played with, did you? Or well, did not you? really. It was, no. it was only just a couple of boys around me that I played with and they were struggling to find stuff, um, contracts and that, and then I pretty much just helped them. And for me, it wasn't about poaching. It was all about just word of mouth, like, mm. like you said. You know, you help yeah. one guy out and you do well, then he'll sort of mention it to the other boys. Mm. Um, so, yeah. Work ethic has always been uh, the cornerstone of yep. your success. Mm -hmm. um, and I suppose... For you, is there any truth to the rumour of uh, league on Sundays and continuing <laughs> to work at the dock whilst being a super rugby player? Uh, yeah. <laughs> you probably can't do it now. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I used to go to church on Sundays and we used to drive past... Because, uh, obviously, I grew up playing rugby league. Um, I actually played um, for the Canberra Raiders, actually, with Shone Fa Oh, really? Um, I had a pre-season game. Well, literally... I was, um, I was actually working at the docks and I came home uh, in the morning and I got a phone call um, and it was from one of the Kiwi boys and said, oh, listen, um, uh, Mel Meninga's after your number. Um, can, I, can I pass it on? <laughs> and I said, Start Mel Meninga. And he said, yeah, they're, they're coming in next week to uh, play the Warriors. And it was a preseason game and I said, oh, yeah, pass it on if you want. So anyway... The following week came and then got a phone call. It was Mel Meninga and he said, um, listen, Sammy, I want you to, uh, you know, we're keen on, uh, on you having a run for us. Would you be interested? And I said, oh, when is it? And he said, oh, it's today. And I said, <laughs> I said, I said oh, yeah, oh, oh, awesome. I'll, I'll be keen. So anyway, I hung up and then I told my brothers and then I said, listen, Mel Meninga's on the way. And they were like, shut up. And they're like, they didn't even believe me. So anyway, went down to the hotel and that. And... Um, Mal Meninga met me at the uh, at North Shore at the uh, Ponami where, we where the boys were staying and that and um, yeah so introduced me at all it was funny because their their preparation is like so like they just sort of just individual just like they just sleep all day just get get up have breakfast on their own and that and just leave it to it and um, so you know I was just hanging around there for the day and you know the likes of Laurie Daly Ricky Stewart all these guys that you've been watching TV you know watching on TV playing and that. And um, so anyway, jump on the bus and head down to um, the game was at uh, Ponsonby Rugby Club playing against the New Zealand Warriors. Um, so I ended up playing. So, um, so, when I, so, so when I play, I normally play uh, hooker. So I play hooker when I play rugby league. Um, so anyway, first 10 minutes, one of the boys got injured and so I got on at fullback. So I played that, jumped in at hooker as well. So I really enjoyed that. And uh, <laughs> the funny thing is that afterwards, 
I said to the said to the kit man, I said, oh, can I have the jersey? And he goes, yeah. So anyway, I took it off. I gave it to my brother, and then um, you know, signing autographs and that. And then as I'm walking through the changing, uh, walking into the changing room, the security stops me because no, no, players only. <laughs> and I said, no, no, I'm part of the player. And he's like, no, no. Like this. And I was like, oh my gosh. So anyway, Mal Meninga was walking past me. I said, Mal, security won't let me in. And he goes, no, he's one of us. So anyway, I walked past him and I gave the guy a look at him. <laughs> so anyway, yeah. So then a um, couple of weeks later, they they called me back and they offered me a three-year contract to move oh. to uh, Canberra Raiders. Wow. And, um, yeah, and, and, you know, sign a three-year deal. So I told mum and dad and that, and they were like, well, nah, you're too young to go by yourself. So was, How old were you at this point? I was uh, 19. 19, so this is a few years before you made the Blues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, so I said, so I just, oh, well. So, so I just carried on. I carried on uh, playing rugby. Um, and, yeah, and then... <laughs> So you just end up making all the teams, and so yeah. The story could have been way different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you've been fighting your teammate, Roy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mal Meninga, like, what a phone call to get. You you got a phone call from one of the all-time greats. Oh, out no, of I, could, I couldn't believe it as well. Yeah. Um, but you know, even my brothers and their dad couldn't believe it in that. And um, but yeah, you know, just those sort of stories that stick That's with awesome. you. No, I haven't really. So I yeah. don't really tell anyone. But yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then, as Jipper was referring to, you you sign with the Blues. But you've still got another job on the side. Yeah, well, I, <laughs> I, I signed up. Uh, I used to go to university with my sister and my brothers, and they, and they obviously just got bored one day and went down to the to the cafe, um, to the everywhere all the students and that, and there was like job applications and all that. So I ended up filled one in and that, and ended up getting a job down at the docks. Um, so yeah, and then just started working nights down at the docks and that, and then uh, obviously I'd, I'd work to about we'd, we'd started about. 10 o'clock and we'll finish sometimes if we, if we finished early then we'll finish about sort of five and then I'll go home have a sleep and then go back to trainings and in, in, uh, in the mornings <laughs> and so that uh, but that's only because I really enjoyed working with all my, all my cousins and that and you know it's just one of those things when you've brought up all your cousins that you just enjoy being with them and um, and I got the same sort of buzz of, of training as well with the boys you know like you had that energy to train even when you're tired so and when you're young, you sort of don't really think yeah. about it, you know, and uh, I guess it was just one of those things. When did you sleep? <laughs> oh, well, I'm quite lucky, you know. People used to call me the mork pork because I don't really like to sleep, you know. I probably <laughs> have three or four hours of sleep and then uh, good to just go. get up, good to go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that was that. Mm -hmm. and, and then why did you quit the docks? <laughs> I quit the docks because uh, there was one night, so we used to be the latches of uh, do the containers and that. And uh, the big chains and the big crane comes over and you latch the uh, the chains onto the onto the corners of the uh, the containers. And I was on there was the top it was the first ones and all that. And um, and as I was at the top, the wave hit hit the ship and it, and it rocked the ship. And uh, I lost my balance and I fell over uh, overboard and fell into the water. <laughs> and then I just thought from that time I was like, oh, you know what? If I injure myself, I won't be able to play rugby. <laughs> How am I going to explain to the coaches that I've hurt myself? So, so yeah. So then from then I just caught it quits and then just carried on uh, yeah. playing the rugby. That's just a hot cold bath, man. <laughs> yeah. Not doing your recovery. <laughs> no, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but then when you were playing with the Blues, rugby league stuck around it was still a thing you wanted to do yeah you know i you know i always enjoyed playing rugby league uh, and you know i still preferred rugby league over rugby mm. um and you know, every sunday you drive from when we're driving past going to church you know you can see you all the crowd and they're coming so then obviously after church we're coming back then i'd always stop in and then always because obviously in tia is a small well back yeah. then it used to be a small um you know town and that and used to know everyone so i used to just you know jump Park up at that and just speak to the coach, and then he goes, "Oh, you're jumping at half uh, half time." So he said, yeah. "Have a game of rugby league in there on the Sunday, <laughs> and then uh, you know, and then head back to do the recovery back on on the Monday for the Blues in there." So and it never got back to ten or anyone. Nah. No. <laughs> oh, there were a couple of times when I got injured, but then I had to sort of fake it and get, get injured on the Monday morning, and then obviously you just had to. <laughs> 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 Always come up with a reason for an injury. Yeah. <laughs> Any of our viewers who uh, aren't from New Zealand, Chartertoo's West Auckland. And yeah. it's, it's a pretty strong rugby league stronghold and the Chartertoo roosters are right on the motorway. So when it's big there, you yeah, know, like, yeah, like yeah. you drive no, past no, there. That's right. Well, funny enough, when even when I was playing the Blues and that, and then obviously I was playing for Ponsonby as well. When we had a week off and that, you know, the Ponsonby always wanted me to play, you know, for the for the first team. But I was like, but I felt real bad because you know when I had time, um, had a game when I wasn't playing, and they expect you to come back. You know I felt bad because you know you had players there that would be you know they did preseason, played all the games, and then all of a sudden they're being dropped because one of the boys had come back from the Blues. Mm. So I used to argue with them. You know I used to say, well I'm not going to play. So I used to go and play presidents. 
because uh, <laughs> well, obviously my brothers and they were playing there. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and I used to go play with them and you know, enjoy that run. But then obviously, <laughs> you know, I can remember this one game we were playing against Oda Hu. And um, yeah, obviously some of the players and they recognised who I was. And, and honestly, like, coming back and playing as well, like, um, you know, you get the old shots in there, which I didn't <laughs> mind, you know. Because, you, know, you know, I played in the village games and that, you know, the island village games, the Tongan ones here, yeah. you know, during when I was coming through NPC as well. So, you know, you used to take all the hits in there, which I didn't mind because... You know, you always get some guy trying to, you know, make a mark and all that. But my brothers didn't hate it, so I say anyway, anyone that would always try and hit, you know, <laughs> tackle me, then they'll be out scrapping them. And I was like, just take it easy, you know, just enjoy the game, man. So, so, yeah, so I always enjoyed going back and playing for the Ponsby um, Prezies as well. Yeah. Uh, EPs, they used to call it. Um, so, yeah, I used to go back and play for them. So I did. So at least the guy that played in the senior team didn't miss out. So, so yeah. yeah. How does New Zealand rugby differ from what you experienced up in the, in the north? Um, to be honest, I find that um, the boys in the UK are a lot bigger. Yeah. Bigger and stronger because, mate, like I never really did weights here and then until I went there and like weights was just almost like another training session. I was like, holy moly. <laughs> you know, and then all of a sudden I've seen my, I noticed that I'm putting on more weight, uh, more weight from doing a lot of weights and, and I didn't like it, you know, and mm. obviously it was just everyone had to do weights and that and it was it was almost like so when we train like we used to have like six seven um snc uh, coaches so you know so you always had an snc for each group and that you know and you always had to sort of better your you know get a pb or you know get close to it and i hated it you know i never really liked weights and that and you know the blues and that you sort of just do as much as you can you know what you can <laughs> and then you know they're not looking out over you so uh so you know, you used to do whatever you can, do a bit of rehab, and that was it. But over there, oh man, they love it, they eh? love it over there. And how did it affect you? Like, if you're carrying more bulk and all that stuff, did, did you feel sluggish on the field? Um, no, well, mind you, I, I, I think my speed got a bit slower, um, but it sort of, uh, you know, obviously everyone loved, you know, because they're quite big, especially the forwards, and they, because the game, I think that the game over there is a lot slower, but I think there's more contact as well. Because the boys are a lot heavier, the grounds are heavy as well. So literally, you're always the game's a bit, you know, sort of brick wall. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so I, I enjoyed it to be honest. <laughs> Has it moved on? Do you think from that now? Like, is is it still the same? Lots of weights, or have they moved on to a different approach? Um, well, no, they still do a lot of weights. Yeah. Um, but I feel that obviously with a lot of the coaching in that now, you find that there's a lot of rugby league coaches coming into rugby now, mm. and the game sort of slowly changing. Um, but now you just find that it's a lot of kicking now. Mm. <laughs> it was just like, oh man, this is not rugby. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, you know, obviously the style of rugby over there is a lot different to here. Mm. And, you know, I like to say that, you know, when a lot of young kids come from New Zealand to the UK, especially the Fords, they were like, holy moly, yeah. this is so much tougher. Yeah. Um, and then they find you find that the cauliflower's ears come out a bit easier yeah. as well over that side of the world. So you often read from this side of the world kind of with interest, like how the people integrate, you know, and often you hear like a lot of the Kiwi players copying flack early on, eh? About, mm. you know, they haven't quite performed in the right way or whatever. Do you do you see that as a problem? And how how do people kind of overcome that, you know, and, and, and get into that new style and figure out mm. how to do it? I guess it's all about adapting, you know. Um you know, obviously, when you get on that side of the world, it's it's all about winning as well. And mm. and it, it, I found it difficult because they had their different way of, of coaching as well. And as much as you, you know, because obviously New Zealand, you've got by far the best coaches. Like I still think that coaches at at the uh, school level is probably a lot better than some of the coaches you have at the higher level in, in Europe. But at the end of the day, you know, that's their job. And as you know, I felt that being over there. It wasn't about being coached. It was about you know them telling you how it's how it's done. And even though you disagreed with that, but you just had to carry on. You just had to carry on on what they said because if you didn't, then obviously you know that's where sort of you're on yeah butting heads all the time with the coaches and that. Then obviously you just find that you're just falling out of love for the game. So yeah. you, you mentioned Ted. Um, there's an old wives' tale going about that you, you may have downtrodden <laughs> at, at some point. It wouldn't be the first time, but yeah, there was a, it, was, it was probably the classic one, and there was uh, probably there was a lot of people around as well. Um, you know, obviously coming back from overseas, you know, I had a break during during the season, so I come back home. And normally when I do come back home, I go watch the boys train, and then um, obviously I got invited to lunch. And, Ted happened to be there for lunch as well, so Ted was the last one sort of to, to get up to get his plate of food and that. And uh, as he was sort of just 
you know, putting the food on his on his, ta on his, on his plate, I sort of went up behind him <laughs> and, and pulled his pants down as well. And the thing is, because he had all his food on his plate, he was like, you know? so he puts it down, he pulls up his pants and he turns around and sees it's me and he slaps me on the face. He goes, who bloody let you back in the country? <laughs> <laughs> He's standing there and his yeah. tiny ways. <laughs> Wife runs from Ted. Yeah. 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 So. Amazing. And then what, what happens there? He, he turns around to the team and goes, they're not be laughing. <laughs> I tell you what, Ted wouldn't be the first one as well. So uh, there's plenty of other coaches out there that, uh, that <laughs> had the same sort of thing. That became your thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> would you have done it if you were playing for him? Oh, mate, I'd, uh, yeah, of course I would. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, that's a mean story. <laughs> but, but the funny thing is, like... Um, now my kids starting to do it as now uh, do it as well, and I'm yeah. like, I can't be doing that, okay? And they're like, but you used to do it. And I'm yeah. like, yeah, I'm, I did it, but you guys shouldn't be doing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. These are the sort of legends that float around Blues um, headquarters, are they? Oh, apparently so. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. Uh, it's funny. Ted, Ted, if, Ted, Ted, if you're coach. watching, I'm sorry, mate. <laughs> sorry. He'd yeah, love it. He'd yeah, love it. He's got a good sense of humor. Yeah, that's, that's he right. Does. He'd be turning that eyebrow up and, <laughs> and doing his thing. Oh man, that's a crazy story. So what about? I mean, you spent most of your career up north though didn't you mm -hmm. so you must have really enjoyed the life up there yeah I mean it was just one of those things um, I, was, I, was, I was homesick and missing the kids and that but then ob obviously opportunities came up mm -hmm. and then obviously um, got engaged and got married and then decided to settle in the UK um, you know I always but then in saying that I was always going to um, when I went to the UK I always wanted to sort of switch to Super League as well. <laughs> so that was always on my mind about switching back to Super League and that. Um, but then obviously got a, a deal at Sale Sharks and then that, that was for three years. And then after that, they offered me another two years on top of that. And then I just thought, you know what, family settled here. Mm. I might as well just, just sort of stick it out and see how it goes for the rest of the career. So People don't really talk about, I suppose, the sacrifices that professional players have to make as far as their families, right? Mm -hmm. Like you have to spend quite a long time away from, from everybody, Jim. Yeah. I, I think um, like any professional sport, you have to be quite selfish. Yeah. Um, because preparation and getting yourself ready mentally, um, you know, takes a lot of, lot of work um, during the week. And the yeah. families do <clears throat> have to sacrifice a hell of a lot, um, you know, even from a parenting point of view, yeah. time and being hands-on isn't as realistic as that you know most would like. Yeah. So you, when you went on the docks, now you're you're on the phone all night long <laughs> <laughs> between uh, catching up with everyone. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, that, I mean, you know, I've grown up. You know, my parents used to work two jobs. Mm. Um, you know, they were never home because they were too busy working. Um, but trying to support the family, you know, and my sister sort of raised us. You know, I'm the youngest out of uh, out of eight. Mm. So, you know, I had all my brothers and sisters that sort of looked after me as well, you know, and to be honest, if it wasn't for my brothers, because my, honestly, my brothers and that, probably way better rugby players than, than myself. You know, they played rugby in there, and I used to love going to watch them play. But, you know, my parents were quite staunch in terms of, we weren't allowed, because obviously back then, Michael Jones had set the trend of, mm. you know, for Christians and they're not so playing nice. on Sunday. Mm. So then obviously my brothers and my brothers couldn't play on a Sunday as well. But I was lucky enough that my brothers and that would sneak, you know, would go to church and then my brothers and that would sneak me away to, to my trials <laughs> and that, you know, and I was able to sort of make the teams from there. So, um, you know, to be honest, I've got to thank my brothers and that for their support, my, my sisters as well, because if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't have been playing, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, that's incredible. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that must be something you look back on, well, I suppose, with a lot of yeah, yeah. humility and, and, and thanks. Yeah, no, yeah. No, always. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we read about your son, Essendon. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Like, it sounds like he is a chip off the old block. Well, he's a lot talented than me. Yeah. Uh, and obviously he's got a lot more speed as well. So, you know, he's doing well. Um, and, you know, hopefully I've always said to him that it's just all part of the progress uh, process. And, you know, he still hasn't made it yet. So just keep learning. Uh, he's got plenty of boys around who got, you know, so much experience and it's all about sort of learning from them. Mm, uh, Essendon is uh, a midfield back, played for Kelston, mm -hmm. been to New Zealand under 21s like you, yep. like he's done it all in pretty much this very similar manner. Do you see a similar style or what do you see? Is he nah, his he's, own player? He's, he's his own player. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he's a lot faster, a lot more talented, and he uses his head as well. He's, he's good at sort of, you know, sharing away from all the contacts <laughs> and all that, you know. So I always say to him, you know, um, he, he's probably 
not as confident. Like for me, because I was always the smallest, I always had to work hard and, and sort of prove a point mm. where he sort of doesn't have to. You know, he's got a lot of speed to sort of burn, you know, um, to get around players. And that. so I said to him, you know, there are times that when you can have to take contact, but if you look at Rico, man, just use your speed. Yeah. Just get around players. <laughs> so, and, and also it prolongs your career as well. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Yeah. So what I used to think is like one less training day is one more training day at the other. Yeah, day yeah, day. yeah. No, that's right. <laughs> we were talking earlier about, I suppose, things that are passed on, right, Jip, from a professional player to a, a budding professional player. Yeah, and I, I think Essendon's in a very fortunate position to have, you know, I suppose the guidance of someone that's gone through it um, because it's not for everyone. Yeah. You know, yeah. it is, it's a, you know, everyone does see, I suppose, the limelight and um, I suppose all the perks that come with it, but there is, as, as mentioned, a lot of sacrifice. Probably don't like using the word sacrifice because it's a choice. Yeah. Mm. Um, but yeah, I, from what I've heard from people um, at the Blues, is uh, you know put his talent aside as a human being, he's he's, he's you know world class and in, in, in the way he approaches everyone in the building, but also um, I, I think he's studying as well, isn't he? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so he's he's getting himself sorted outside. Well, of that can be well. questionable, but. <laughs> <laughs> <Nah>. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, fair enough. Um, I remember talking to uh, Caleb Clark about his dad, and and I was I kind of said to him, you know, you're one of the the guys who's extremely lucky in that you're probably the first generation of players whose fathers have been professional rugby players, so mm. they've had the ability to learn things mm. that you don't have to learn by yourself. Yeah. You can have passed on. He said what his dad did was put him into athletics. You know, mm. teach him how to stride. Look at him now; he, he can stride. Yeah. Oh, you know, yeah, um, yeah, is there anything like that that you you went to Essendon with? Yeah, well, f well funny enough, um, Essendon was homeschooled for my sister. So my sister, so my sister that looks after my kids, so she's got eight kids of her own, and then she's got my four. Mm. So she's got eight kids and she homeschooled them all. Wow. Well, she was That's homeschooling impressive. them. And then um, obviously when it got to sort of the boys' senior years and I said to my sister, oh, could you let them go to school? Because obviously to get through to, you know, the, to get into the... Um, System. The system, you've got to be playing at school. Yeah. And um, so anyway, she was going to send them to St. Peter's because St. Peter's had often, because obviously the boys play a lot of basketball mm. and they got through, you know, and basketball is always their number one sport. And um, so anyway, they, they've been offered a scholarship to St. Peter's. And then I was like thinking, I was like, oh no, I don't want them to go to St. Peter's. <laughs> um, it's only because, like, um, I see a lot of kids from out west and that jumping on the bus. Mm and going out central, you know, and you look at all the schools out west where there's so many good schools, mm. but they're not achieving because they don't have the talent. But mm. we actually do have the talent, but actually they're all, being, they're all going elsewhere. So anyway, um, there was a group of players that Essendon used to play with and that, and, and I said to um, my sister, I said, oh, you know, let Essendon go to school because quite a lot of those boys he played with are going to Calston as well. Mm. So, um, so you know, she, she, did, she said, but lucky enough, um, John Senior, obviously, who I used to, who's played for the Blues and that um, brother of Kevin Senior, mm. um, he was he's teaching at Calston oh. Boys, and my sister and obviously I said to John, I said, oh, just have a word of her because obviously John, you know, really respectable and. Um, you know, obviously, my sister won't take my word for it, but she'll take John's. <laughs> so anyway, John actually had a meeting with my sister and Anne. Then after that, my sister's like, OK, I'll send them calcins only because you're there and I know that you'll look after them. Yeah. So anyway, so she let them go and that. And um, yeah, and the boys just sort of just flourish. just flourish from there. But at the same time, I had the coaches in that ringing me and saying, you know, the boys are not concentrating on rugby. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, because they're playing basketball, you know, when they're supposed to be you know, rugby training. And I said, and obviously doing athletics as well. You know, Essendon uh, broke the uh, long jump uh, record at Calston. Oh, wow. Um, but unfortunately, because of COVID, he hadn't been able to go to uh, the Nationals. Obviously playing basketball as well, he loves basketball. Mm. And um, <clears throat> so anyway, and, and I said to the coach as well, you know, I've always encouraged the kids to play all the sports in that because you could always take every skills from all the other ones and add it to, um, apply it to the whatever sports they want to play at the end of it. And they disagreed with it and, um, you know, Essendon was, he was always like never made the first, like he was always never selected for the starting team, but every now and then he would sort of get, get a break in that. And then, you know, I was lucky enough that he got the break for the, Blues uh, 18s and that, and then made the Blues uh, New Zealand 19s. 
and then just managed to get through there. So, um, you know, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the feedback I get from all the coaches there is like his agility is unbelievable. And I personally think it was from, you know, doing basketball and volleyball that, you know, you sort of, you activate those small muscles that you don't actually activate when, you, when you're doing all the rugby skills and that. So, mm. so, yeah, so, you know, I really encourage a lot of young kids in that to do all the sports and that as you can at high school because, you know, it does help you and you can apply it to other sports as well, so. At the Athletes Federation, you guys have all sorts of sports under that roof, don't you? Like, what's the general consensus there about these kind of topics, about specialising super early? Like, you see so many of these kids now, like, they're 12 years old and they've given up everything else mm. and they've gone into an academy and that's that. Yeah, I think, I, I can't speak for that part of the office, obviously, but um, from a personal opinion base, I think we're coming out the other side of that now. And yeah. I think everyone's realising this specialised under the thumb approach is, yeah. is just too much for young young people to deal with. So mm. having the freedom to just play as many, um, yeah. I think, is will be more common. I and mean, I think you know Sam's completely right. It only makes you better. Like you you think about, I think it was Ellie Williams. He played soccer up until seventh form, and yeah. a lot of that skill set, uh, that hand eye coordination, you know, mm. he, he credits for his time at soccer as a goalie. And, and mm. you, so you see it time and time again. People that make the you know Jeff Wilson, another one. You know, yeah. So. Um, I think there's enough out there to prove that it's it's probably more beneficial than a hindrance. Yeah, you take the risk of being dunked on by your son, though. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, I just let him dunk him. I don't, I don't even bother. Just kind of stop him. He's posterising dad, eh? Hey? <laughs> <laughs> can, can you dunk? No. No, no, no. I take it he can. He can, he get can up there. yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, nice, nice. And does he does he still sideline in a bit of basketball? Well, he's, well, he's had to put... Well, actually, he's had to put basketball on the side because uh, there's a couple of times when he's sort of almost injured himself. So I said to him, you know, now, obviously, you've got to make that, yeah. that, that choice now because now that you're in the environment, Rugby's got to come first. Before we get into the full analysis of the rugby on the weekend, we'd say thank you very much to Sam for uh, for joining us. No, you're welcome. Thank um, you for having me on. Good luck for the fight. Cheers. Well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and if you want to catch Sammy fighting on Sky Sport, you can catch it on Thursday night. It's the Fight for Life at Event Finder Stadium. You've got Sam versus Roy Satasi, Liam Messam versus Judson Hodges. That should be an absolute doozy because Hodges threw some punches in his yeah, days. Yeah. Eh? Yeah, well, he, and he, he uh, yeah. put Gallon down in that um, three fight. Yeah. Yeah, so that should be a cracker. DJ Falls versus Sione Farmoina should be an interesting one. He's got an engine. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> It'll be going the distance, I'd say. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And on top of that, as uh, a a few major fights, uh, Miyamoto versus a Canadian Tanya Walters, a uh, middleweight fight between Andre Mikhailovich and Venezuelan Edison Saltarian, and the big one, Jerome Pampaloni, light heavyweight from New Zealand versus Emmerich Diwali. Make sure you catch that, but most of all, make sure you get in and you catch Sam for his, uh, <laughs> his big bout knockout time. I was going to put, put a pressure on myself and, uh, off, and ask for a bonus if I knock him out first round, but I thought, oh, you know, I'll just, <laughs> just take it easy. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, mate. Well, thank you very much for joining us. No, no really worries. appreciate it. Cheers. Thank you. It's going to be a big weekend of Super Rugby. We've got the Chiefs versus the Crusaders and the Hurricanes versus the Blues. That's the top four teams all against each other. So after coming out of a slightly lean patch over the last few weeks with a lot of buys, we're hitting the ground running with the games that could make this whole thing work. Jipper. Yes. Chiefs versus Crusaders. Round one, we saw the Chiefs get up and it was a surprise at the time, but now it's of no surprise this is the team to beat. <coughs> Can you see the Crusaders returning the favour this weekend? Uh, potentially, because I think they're getting some key players back. I thought David Havili was massive um, on the weekend. You know, we saw Jack Goodhue out there uh, again, um, Cullen Grace. So they are getting a bit of the artillery back, but um, I think this is a real statement game for the Chiefs. You know, a couple of times they were beaten at home last year, um, and obviously one of them was the Crusaders. So uh, I, I think their focus and their edge will be will be right up there. And their performance on the weekend against the Drua in those conditions was world class. And like to score those points, execute their kicking plan like they did, um, and and once again their defence. Like we spoke about how they held the Canes to 45% gain line. Well, they held um, the Drua to 43%. Another big, strong pack that are used to getting over the game line, but defensively, they're shutting them down and tackled at 93%. So they, they, they are right in their sweet spot at the moment, and, and all, their, all their players are performing. And they did that without two of their real tackling geniuses, Sam Kane and Luke Jacobson. Yeah, I thought Cullen Boshier was um, massive. Um, he looked really good in the seven jersey. I think he was 11 carries, 11 tackles. So that next man up, we've so, seen it so often with the Crusaders over the years. You know, the, when the guy gets an opportunity, he takes it, it puts pressure on the incumbent. So 
the Crusaders went over to the Rebels and that looked for a little bit like it was not going to go the right way. No, it, it didn't, but you always felt they were in control. Like, there was a few, you know, I suppose the only thing they'll be disappointed about is um, those sort of close goal line defences. Like, they pride themselves on that defence and making sure they stop it. But other than that, they, they look pretty slick. Um, and especially some of those guys coming off a big break, um, they, they ran over the top quite convincingly in the end, I, I, I felt. So Chiefs win for you? They'll do it again. They've got too many guys in form. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we um, isolated Brodie Retallick yep. about the rucks. So I, I did some work over the weekend, and so he hit a total of 33 rucks in that Chiefs game. The next best was um, Sam Penny Finau um, at 21. So that's a, quite a big yeah. discrepancy. And then I w went through every other game, and there's only one player that had more rucks with them is Tom Christie, which you expect um, with sevens, because they enter a lot of defensive breakdowns. Um, so again, like he is just, the numbers he's churning through at the moment mm. are serious, and, and these aren't wasted, right? He's not just standing at the back, you know, playing the piano. He's using his shoulder <laughs> and moving, you know, moving bodies yeah. every single time. And if he enters a defensive one, he's either, you know, gets a turnover, gets a penalty, or at least absorbs three or four cleaners, which, you know, gives them the ability for their defense to do what they're doing. So guys like him are just playing such a massive, um, roll up front um, and uh, I think you know you sort of saw in the Highlands game everyone jokes about it but when the boys up front can't get you that platform it's pretty hard to execute your game plan. What's, what's going on with the Highlanders? What they'll be disappointed by is I suppose the discipline really put them under pressure early and it gave the force the ability to get up you know two yellow cards and I know the force had theirs but you know it, it just made it you know 20 line breaks the force had and I looked at the stats and they tackled at 91 percent so the, the impact, the amount of clean breaks that happened when those when they were down to 13 was, mm. was quite impactful. And don't forget that they might not have scored, I think they only scored seven points during that period, the force, but the 13 men out there are having to cover two people, so mm. it empties the tank, and then discipline gets you know, even more challenged because they're, they're fatigued. So I don't think you can read into it too much. I, th I, I do think those yellow cards played a big, big part, um, but I think there'll be a big focus on their D this yeah. week because that's where they got into trouble and you know, you know I think the Tars will see that and they'll be coming you know right through the front door I'd suggest. Well I mean they're at risk of falling out of the top eight the Highlanders when you look at what's going on on the table there are so many teams that are close um, just two points between sixth and tenth and that's the Reds the Landers the Force the Drua and the Tars. It's a, it's a big week for them you know like we say it's a statement game for the Chiefs but I think this is a you know, and tar, the Tars are in the same spot, man. Like they, they've, they showed moments of, of brilliance, but I think the Blues were, you know, all class on the weekend. But they, they've got a good driving mall. Mm. So if I was them, you know, you'd be playing that kick strategy, get down there and have a crack. Um, you know, at probably the Highlanders' perceived weakness. Um, but also having some trick plays off the back of them all because the Highlanders this week's focus is going to be mall D. You know, mm. so they're going to want to get. It, absolutely right. So that sometimes that creates opportunity in and around of the tail of the lineup because everyone's so fixated on stopping them all. So um, making sure they, they you know have enough tricks in the bag for the Tars at home, um, I think it, it could be a tough night for the Highlanders. The other big game this week is the Hurricanes versus the Brumbies. The Brumbies are an interesting side because we don't really understand where they're at in the context of the top four. They didn't bother sending a team to Christchurch. They sent an also ran team to Christchurch. They did beat the Blues, but they haven't played the Chiefs or the Hurricanes. So we don't really know. This is a good litmus test for them. Uh, we, we know what they'll come with. They'll be yeah. coming with their driving mall. Um, but they've got some you know, real firepower and, and tool, um, and, you know, even uh, right um, out wide. So they, they've, they've got the ability to do it both ways. But um, you know, windy night, depending on um, where things are at the Cake Town, you'd have to think they'll believe they can go you know, through, through the Canes pack. Um, and I think it's a big test for them. Like, we always know their loose forwards are world class. There's no question on that. But type five is always sort of question. So I think it's, you know, whoever starts at hooker, it's a big night, both All Blacks, um, Colsey or Almoor, but, you know, Lomax. Um, I think you know, Numir's going really well. Um, and then obviously the locking combo, whoever, whoever that may be, um, they need a big shift up front. So do you feel like this is a 50-50 game? Or do you feel like yep. this is the Hurricanes game? <clears throat> I, I think the Hurricanes will win. I think they go in favourites, but it's, it, it will be tight. I, I, you know, I just there's something about the Brumbies, and they they they've they've got a resilience, a little bit like the Crusaders in a way. Like even when they're out of the game, um, mm. you know, I think if you use the Tars game from yeah. earlier this year, like they should, 
they had no right to win that game, but they, they stay in the fight, they keep believing and, and they just keep plugging away. Sometimes it's boring rugby, but it's, a, it's effective and gets results. Well, that top four is going to look interesting. Um, the Blues, on the other hand, have got a, a very good opportunity over the next couple of weeks because they've got uh, the draw and minor. This is going to be game. hard this week, though. Yeah. Like, going to Fiji, is, as we've seen. Yeah. You know, um, it's afternoon footy. It's it's really weighted. I suppose it's back in um, Lautoka as well. Um, so it's not on the surface, so it'll be, it'll be roaring hot. Um, even if it's wet, it'll be hot. Um, so I, I'm sure after the Crusaders... Um, hiccup, you know, they would have put a lot of work and planning around, you know, acclimatising, you know, in the weeks leading up. They would have done a lot of heat heat chamber work or whatever to get the bodies um, ready. So I'm really looking forward to that game because I don't think it's a given and I think it's it's an awesome test. So I think the Blues really lifted a notch. I thought that was the best they'd performed in a long time. Um, and even guys stepping up, I thought Zion Sullivan was fantastic, man. He looked really, really good. Um, so, you know, with Stevie P obviously um, out, um, at least you've got those able, you know, we know that squad depth's massive, um, but it's certainly going to get tested this week because the draw won't be happy with their performance against the Chiefs. Again, I go back to it, <clears throat> they, they obviously had a lot of kick pressure and, and they were getting that, um, you know, going through the first five and they probably needed to kick from nine a little bit more, mm. which meant their ruck tally started cr creeping up in the 22. And you know, every time they've had a loss, it's their ruck tally um, is so high, I think there are 18 in their own 22, whereas every time they've won, it's like two or three. Mm. Um, and the conditions didn't really allow for them to be playing too much footy, um, but the Chiefs put them under a lot of pressure. They didn't really, uh, I suppose, react to it. They really did struggle to exit at times, didn't they? And it yeah. cost them two tries at least, that exit play. Well, I mean, we speak about, we've been speaking about a lot of, um, you know, players playing well in the Chiefs, but Sonny Penny Finau, the amount of kick pressure he was putting on, um, his work off the ball, does he come into the conversation? Um, you know, for, for All Blacks. He is, he is playing the house down and, and getting through a mountain of work. Um, so I think, you know, and there's a lot of injuries, you know, I think Kira Ioane's back, um, you know, Shannon Frizzell's back, but no one's really, you know, Ethan Blackadder was probably, you know, going really, really well until he got injured again. So there is, there is space there, and if, if the Chiefs keep performing, he keeps knocking on the door. But the one thing I'm loving to see out of him is his effort areas. I know, you know, people in the comments section love me and my effort areas, but um, it is... It is so valuable, and you saw Brad last week, we talked about Tupo Va'i. Mm. You know, it's no different um, to Sammy Penifino and how much the players and the group understand the importance of it. Um, you know, he's, he's another one. The Blues, well, they've struggled to get two wins in a row throughout the season, right? But they've been picking up a lot of bonus points. That was they've managed their, to stay in the fight. That was their game, though. Like, like that was probably, you know, the best I've seen them play in terms of that ruck speed, you know, keeping the ball alive, running flat and fast, running holes, um, you know, on attack. But then also defensively, they kept the they kept the Waratahs, which okay, it's wet night, it is easier defensively, but they kept the Waratahs to 32% gain line. Like yeah. the Waratahs just they, they they were just swarming them. They'll be disappointed with the 21 points, but well probably the the mall, um, you know, was a given. Like he, that was a good try from the hooker, but the other two were just sort of um, you know one on one missed tackles. Um, so they won't be happy about that, but their defensive effort, um, physicality was was huge. And I think that's, I, I keep going to that for all these teams doing well, because defence is what's mm. going to actually win you this title. And, and they looked really, really strong that side of the ball. Yeah, big weekend of action would be really good. Oh, so good. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, we haven't been able to get uh, to viewer questions this week because we had Sam on, so it's a bit busy. But we will get to some of your viewer questions next week, including a cracker from Sigrun Owen who sent through a video on our submission feed. So you can all also send through a video question and Sigrun will get to yours next week. You'll see the key at the bottom here with the place you need to go to to submit a video to us and we'll play your video and we'll answer your questions. Um, please jump on the YouTube channel as well and we'll answer whatever questions you put in the comments section. So bear with us. Unfortunately, no time for it this week, but we will do it again next week. We've really enjoyed that section of the show. So once again, for the Aotearoa Rugby Pod, thank you very much. Cheers, mate. It was a good day. There were oh, cracking stories there. Man, that was so, he was so open. It was great. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I hope he's as great with the boxing. Yeah, I'm yeah, sure he will I, be. I, I, I back him. Yeah, yeah. I feel like there's an X factor there. Yeah. <laughs> he's a guy who wants it. I think it's going to be a fast left hook. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, thank you very much for joining us once again on the Aotearoa Rugby Pod. We will catch you next week once again. Matewa.